Coming up next on KPBS Evening Edition, most teenagers, 18 and younger, will be banned from tanning beds. And potential employers won't be able to look up your credit history. Those are just a couple of hundreds of the new laws that go into effect next week in California. Also, a multi-million dollar judgment in a deadly military jet crash. It falls far short of what the victim's family had been asking for. KPBS Evening Edition starts now. Hello, thanks for joining us. I'm Joanne Farian. And I'm Peggy Pico, in for Dwayne Brown. We begin tonight with a nearly $18 million judgment against the federal government for a deadly jet crash in University City. Four people were killed in that crash, and their family had asked for $56 million in compensation. The government has admitted responsibility for the 2008 crash, which was blamed on a mechanical failure in a Marine jet. The Marine Corps says there were also poor decisions by the pilot and personnel on the ground. The jet slammed into the home of the Yoon family, killing a woman, her two young daughters, and her mother. I still harbor no ill will against the United States Marine Corps pilot involved in this crash who did everything he could to prevent this tragedy. And that, of course, was the attorney of the victim's husband reading a statement. The money will be split among the husbands of the two women killed and the adult siblings of one victim. Prosecutors are reviewing the case against a pair of pit bull owners whose dogs attacked a Paradise Hills woman last summer. The victim died on Christmas Eve. It's not clear if Imako Mendoza's death was connected to the dog attack. She lost an arm and part of a leg after being attacked by two dogs in her front yard. The dogs were euthanized. Their owners already face criminal charges, but now prosecutors must decide whether more charges will be filed because of Mendoza's death. We have a follow-up for you tonight on our story about the California Innocence Project. Earlier this month, we introduced you to some law students here in San Diego who are working to exonerate people whom they believe were wrongly convicted. A ruling is expected in one of those cases after the holidays. It's a 1995 murder case from Santa Clarita, and a judge is deciding whether to reopen it after a key witness recanted her testimony. A shot in the neck may help improve symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. The innovative treatment is being tested at Naval Medical Center San Diego. Nearly four dozen active duty service members have volunteered to get an injection of anesthesia in the neck during a three-month pilot study on PTSD. Navy doctors believe the shot works like a nerve block to turn off triggers that cause anxiety, nightmares, and other PTSD symptoms. The drug's benefits only last for about a month and require re-injection. A larger study at various sites across the country will be done if current research proves the shots are beneficial. Now, tomorrow, the California Supreme Court is expected to rule on a pair of bills regarding redevelopment agencies. One of the bills effectively eliminates the agencies, and the other allows them to continue to operate as long as they contribute more money to local schools. Those bills were part of Governor Jerry Brown's plan to fix the state budget. The move was opposed by many cities and by the redevelopment agency themselves. They also filed a lawsuit. The agencies say the bills violate Proposition 22, a voter-approved measure that forbids the state from borrowing or taking funds from cities and counties. If the court overturns the governor's move, that could mean more funds for the projects here in San Diego, including a new stadium for the Chargers. As the new year starts, a lot of new laws will go into effect. Joanne takes a closer look at some of those laws with her guest at the Evening Edition Roundtable. The California State Legislature passed more than 700 new laws last year. Most of them take effect January 1st. The laws range from banning people from openly carrying handguns to preventing minors from using tanning beds. There are also a number of new laws protecting the rights of gays and lesbians. Joining me to talk about what some of these new laws will mean to San Diegans is Carl Luna, professor of political science at San Diego Mesa College and lecturer at the University of San Diego. Thanks, Carl, for being here. Nice to be here. So more than 700 
700, that seems like a lot of new laws. Is that a high number, relatively speaking? Yeah, it's that issue of big numbers. We all kind of glaze over anything over 20, so we hear 700, that's a lot. Congress averages three to 4,000 a year, and the last few years has been doing 9,000. Back in 99, California had over 1,000 new laws. So given all the various problems the state has, Getting down to 750, <laughs> that's something of a lean, mean fighting okay. machine. Not so bad then. Uh, I mentioned a couple of these laws. California is sometimes referred to as the nanny state. One example, a law that actually wasn't passed, but one of them that, that was debated last year, whether or not hotels could even use flat sheets. They could only use fitted sheets. So things like that give us a reputation of being a nanny state. Do some of these laws, do we deserve that reputation when you look at some of these new laws? Look, nobody likes big government unless it's their big government. The case of the fitted sheets. Workers in hotels having to do those non-fitted sheets, bending over, arm injuries, back injuries. It was enough of a problem for an organized group to go to the legislature and say, help us out. What happens in interest group politics with thousands of groups going to Sacramento, they're going to ask for stuff and nobody gets a reward for not giving something. It's like a trick or treat. If you don't put something in somebody's bag, they're going to egg your house. Politicians have to pass laws to respond to what their constituents are asking for. What do you see as the most significant new laws that will take effect January 1? Actually, the most significant is what didn't get passed, like the dog that didn't bark. We are still in year, what is it now, 423 of the great economic deficit crisis for the state. We don't really have a road map of how we're going to ride this out. Everybody's just hoping every year that maybe the economy will come back. And given falling revenue figures, the money is the big issue on the table. The rest of these laws are kind of like icing around a cake which is starting to fall flat. Isn't that really a structural problem, though, with California? Prop 13 has a lot to do with it. When we talk about money and revenues, we have a, a, a proposition that was passed, Prop 13, that says you can't increase taxes by more than two-thirds. Doesn't that kind of sort of strangle the legislature somewhat we, in terms of enacting yeah, new... We've frozen a big hunk of our tax base back in the 1970s, the time of avocado green and long sideburns. We don't want to dress that way. We might not want to tax that way. We also have the problem of attracting business in a very competitive global economy. Uh, we have a problem of a lot of structural issues of an aging population and a younger population with the middle class being squeezed. These are all the big issues that Sacramento has a hard time dealing with. In terms of what they de did with on a smaller scale, some of the, the things that might affect people at home, um, the handgun, the open carry, the ban on that, um, Taxes. Uh, if you're buying something online now, if you're uh, doing some shopping in this, as of this next summer, you'll have to pay taxes. Are those some of the things that might actually affect people at home? Well, what could be interesting to see is how they play out politically and judicially because you're into Second Amendment with the uh, carry ban. And when you get into the idea of interstate commerce and taxing the, the out-of-state Internet companies, that's going to put a little bit of blowback. But it, it, for individuals buying stuff on the Internet, you got to pay the sales tax. Maybe you'll be more likely to go down to the local store. What about Chelsea's law? Isn't this one that takes effect January 1st? And that we can sort of trace that one back to Nathan Fletcher, who's yeah. running for mayor. Passed earlier uh, this year, uh, Chelsea's law is definitely going to be a centerpiece, is the centerpiece of the Fletcher campaign. And he'll get a lot more political mileage now that that's back into everybody's mind for the next few weeks uh, going into the new year. Do you, when you look at this very long list, is there, does it say anything about Governor Jerry Brown and his sort of, his style of governing? He is actually more willing to veto and to try to block things. He wants to show that he's not just a big government Democrat. He's the new lean and mean Jerry Brown. Uh, but given the other financial problems of the state, it didn't give him really a great opportunity to shine as the new reform governor. Okay, Carl Luna, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Happy New Year to you. Same to you. San Diego's whale watching season got a head start this month, and marine biologists say it looks like this will be a banner year. A whale watching boat from Dana Point took this video off San Onofre. Birch Aquarium experts say they expect whale migrations to peak earlier than usual this year, and tourists are seeing more whales than they normally see this early in the season. Oh, it's gorgeous. We went whale watching yesterday and it was just like this and it was the first time we've been several times and yesterday we probably saw six or eight whales. Usually only one or two whales are seen on a trip this early in whale watching season. Biologists say early migration typically means the whales got more food than usual during their summer stay in the Arctic, so they head south early to give birth off the Baja coast.
You can see it was a festive scene along San Diego's Harbor Drive this morning thanks to the Big Bay Balloon Parade featuring the largest display of giant character balloons in the western U.S. About 100,000 spectators lined the street to see the balloons, bands, and floats. My favorite balloon is all of them. How do you feel when you see the kids? Oh, it's fantastic. They give you this energy that makes you excited about spinning the balloon and waving and yelling now. Happy New Year, Merry Christmas. The parade was a prelude to tonight's holiday bowl game. Two San Diego brothers are thanking their old high school teacher after winning a prestigious award from Apple. Ian and David Marsh won the iPhone Game of the Year award for Tiny Tower, their 14th game together. 28-year-old Ian Marsh gives credit for his success to his former Sarah High School teacher, Joe Austin. He bought me the first programming book that I ever read, uh, which kind of got me started in um, interactive programming, which is a huge part of making games. And he got me my first contract job making websites for the school district. Austin is now principal of an elementary school in City Heights. To thank him, the brothers donated 30 iPads to the school. The brothers also continue to work on their newest game in their Solana Beach studio. In a moment, we'll continue our review of the big stories of 2011 with a look at immigration issues, controversial checkpoints, a rising number of deportations, and the changing demographics of our region. We'll also take a look at the rising cultural trend among young Latinos inspired by the Mexican drug war. This is KPBS Evening Edition. Tonight on KPBS at 8, a preview of what's to come when global warming causes Arctic ice to diminish, forcing polar bears to live among grizzlies. Arctic bears on nature. Then at 9, lives are risked in the effort to watch melting glaciers and their potential to drive rising sea levels on Nova, extreme ice. And at 10, see evidence from a time when dinosaurs and forests thrived in Antarctica. Secrets beneath the ice on Nova. That's tonight on KPBS. It's a region of majesty and mystery. Home of the tallest mountains in the world. Monty Python's Michael Palin journeys across the lands in the Himalaya range to explore fascinating places. And there you are signing sincerely yours, James yes, Bond. Exactly. Pick it up. Boom. It's a 2,000 mile adventure filled with discovery and humor. I don't think I need any fillings, do I? Himalaya with Michael Palin. Join the adventure Monday at 10 on KPBS. KPBS Evening Edition is made possible by Joan and Irwin Jacobs and by has been a year of interesting trends on the immigration front. While the nation waits for the political climate to change enough to enact immigration reform, economic changes are rapidly, rapidly reshaping the life experiences of immigrants already here. We have two members of the Frontier's desk with us, Jose Jimenez and Roxandra Guidi. Thank you both for joining us. Thank you. Jose, I want to talk about census numbers. They were released this year, and we saw some dramatic changes. Tell us about those. Yes, overall, Latinos continue to grow and are basically have become the largest minority in the country. In this, and the microcosm of this is throughout the Southwest, where most of the Latino population is. The most significant uh, revelation in the census was that finally, for the first time, San Diego County became a majority minority county, basically meaning that there are more minorities than whites in San Diego County. Now, for a long time, San Diego County had bucked the trend. Every other county along the U.S.-Mexico border was already a majority minority county. Now, in 2010, San Diego has reached that point. And what also the census showed was that the, that the Latinos are, or the minorities are beginning to leave their traditional neighborhoods of like Southeast San Diego or the South Bay, and they're moving into North County and basically kind of assimilating with the rest of the population. Now, Rex, you did a story that demonstrated exactly that. You went to Oceanside and you profiled a restaurant. Tell us about that. That's right. So one of these places, one of these communities where an increasing number of Latinos have moved into is, is Oceanside. And I wanted to take a look at 
a community that's made up mostly of retirees called Oceana in Oceanside, which is prim primarily made up of uh, white, Caucasian, uh, middle class, upper middle class retirees, where this little restaurant, Grandma's, a mom and pop little shop, um, had changed hands for the first time from a, a white couple to a Mexican and Mexican American couple. And so I profiled um, Faustino and his wife's restaurant and basically how he was, his restaurant was thriving despite the economy. He's been able to kind of bridge that retirement community slash Latino, you know, new neighborhood and, and thrive on the business that they provide him. So he's kind of an epitome of, of that young Latino growing population. So with this changing demographic, though, we also saw an increased number of deportations under the Obama administration. Uh, do we have some, some numbers for 2011? That's right. Both 2010 and 2011 were record numbers uh, for deportations in the U.S. Um, last year, uh, the Obama administration deported 393,000 people, and about a third of them were people that had no criminal background. So that's where a lot of the criticism came in to this approach. I mean, basically, uh, the Obama administration has been arguing for immigration reform, which hasn't been possible. A lot of Republicans have argued for stricter uh, border enforcement even before they get to discuss or put um, immigration reform on the table. And one way that the Obama administration has addressed that is to try to beef up border security and increase deportations. And another way that deportations are changing besides the increasing numbers is how people are being deported. Before, they basically used to be dropped off at the U.S.-Mexico border and thrown across the other side. Now, there are flights that leave from the U.S. going in deep into Mexico, down into Central America. And we did a series about this, Life After Deportation, chronicling this. They're basically trying to make it harder for people to come back. And in one of the stories, we sat in on a debate from three men discussing whether it's worth it to go back once you reach uh, Guatemala. So that's also another big change uh, in the deportation issue. And we should make the point for our audience, we know that uh, also you did stories um, in the summer, there was a, a memo that came out um, under saying that um, really I should be focused on people who have criminal backgrounds in terms of deportation and not deporting people who, who weren't criminals. That's right. As part of this border enforcement and immigration enforcement, there's been a number of programs, uh, some of them pilot programs like 287G, which basically trains local law enforcement on how to do some um, immigration enforcement, and then also secure communities, which basically shares a lot of the information that, of people that are arrested with ICE, with Immigration Customs Enforcement. So because of all these programs, the number of deportations have increased, and like I said earlier, about a third of those have been of people that have no criminal background. So it's really, it's generated a lot of criticism. We don't have a lot of time, but Escondido is a city that kind of brought this issue to life, didn't it? That's right. Escondido is a place where uh, local law enforcement have been proactively enforcing some federal immigration law. Um, whether they might dispute that, that's a whole other issue. But they've been working in conjunction with ICE, and they've been setting up checkpoints to stop, you know, but which are called safety checkpoints to basically see that there are no drunk drivers out on the roads, but also what's been happening is a lot of people who are undocumented and for that reason they don't have a license have been stopped and they've ended up then being deported even though they don't have a criminal background. And quickly before we go, um, we know that's going to change. New law takes place. They can't do that anymore. That's right. New law AB 353, which starts this year, will no longer, I mean, Escondido will have to stop that practice. Roxandra, Jose, thank you so much. Thank you. Also from our Fronteras desk this year, we looked into a new cultural trend among young Mexican-Americans that finds its inspiration in the Mexican drug war. Jill Replogle reports. At 25 years old, Eleno Serna is doing well. He recently opened his third clothing shop in the San Diego area, catering towards the young and hip. His top-selling items? Shirts with flashy depictions of skeletons, toting AK-47s, and likenesses of Mexican drug lords. This one, a lot of people like this one, the flocking. They, it gives it like a, um, like a more expensive touch. The images of Miguel Angel Felix Gallardo, considered one of Mexico's original cartel leaders. The shirt is one of the hottest selling items in Serna's Antrax clothing line. He started the company just a year ago, and now he says he has more orders than he can handle. Many of Serna's biggest clients are bands and their followers who play a new kind of corrido music called Movimiento Alterado. Corridos are Mexican ballads. Oh.
con cuerno de chivo y basura en la nuca, volando cabezas. Al... Movimiento alterado translates loosely to altered state. And like Serna's clothing designs, Movimiento Alterado bands capitalize on the increasingly ruthless battle among Mexican drug traffickers. This song is called Sanguinarios del M1, or the bloodthirsty of M1. M1 is a nickname for a suspected Sinaloan trafficker named Manuel Torres Felix. The song starts like this, with a goat's horn, that slang for an AK-47, and a bazooka in the crook of the neck, taking off the heads of anyone who crosses. We're bloodthirsty, crazy, agitated, we like to kill. This YouTube video has gotten more than 12 million hits. Movimiento Alterado is the brainchild of Burbank-based music producers Omar and Adolfo Valenzuela. My twin Adolfo. Twin brothers who came to California from Sinaloa, Mexico when they were in high school. Welcome to the music business. They thought up Movimiento Alterado a few years ago while searching for a market for some new bands. We made a couple of mixes, CD mixes, and when we went out in the streets and in the internet to promote those, those groups, that's how it started. Now, Adolfo says, there are thousands of bands performing what they call alterado music on both sides of the border. Elijah Wald, a Boston-based musician who wrote a book about so-called narco corridos, or ballads about drug trafficking, likens Movimiento Alterado to gangster rap, but tailored to the growing population of young Mexican-Americans. This is music for somebody who, who is equally into hip-hop and corridos. In fact, Valenzuela and his brother are in talks with Snoop Dogg about recording songs together. How you say it again? Alterado. Alterado. But as with gangster rap, some are questioning whether a popular youth culture that glorifies violence, this time of the Mexican drug war, can stoke that same violence. Narco corridos have actually been outlawed in several Mexican states. Valenzuela says he's just giving people what they want. Uh, it's a market. It's a market, and I'm in the, in the music industry. And if I don't do it, someone else is doing it. Back at the clothing store, Serna says the El Padrino image represents power. It's just a, it's just a, an image, you know, saying how someone, you know, that it's poor, or that with hard work and, and all that stuff can become, you know, wealthy and, 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 and help people and stuff. At the same time, Serna says the violence across the border hurts him too. I was born here in the United States, but I'm, I'm also Mexican. And it, it hurts me, you know, it hurts me to see my country like that. It's, it's just fashion, you know, like you got to give people what they want to buy right now because it's, it, they, they like it, they want to buy it, they, they're asked for it, they're asking for it. Serna is on his way to designing shoes and hats as well, but he says his next round of designs will be a little tamer. Some people like very busy stuff, some people like very calm. That was KPBS Fronteras reporter Jill Rapoglu. Mexican corrido music has a history of violent lyrics, but observers say the differences with the so-called altered movement is it brings lyrics to life through music, videos, and fashion. Last night, we asked you for your opinions about a cross controversy on the hillside at Camp Pendleton. In a moment, your responses in our public square. This is KPBS Evening Edition. I'm Gwen Eiffel on the next news hour, a look at the year of extreme weather around the world, the causes and the costs. That's Wednesday on the PBS News Hour. The American people have named PBS the most trusted source of news and public affairs for the eighth year in a row. Trust. The American people have spoken. Thank you. Where can you learn the history and uncover the treasures of our region? Right here on KPBS. First, on Ken Kramer's About San Diego, discover the little-known stories behind the things and places in San Diego we see every day. Then, on Crossing South, host Jorge Maraz explores Baja, Mexico, and gets to know the places frequented by the locals. Get to know the people, the food, and the customs of our neighbor to the south, only on Crossing South, starting January 5th on KPBS.
Welcome back to the Public Square on KPBS Evening Edition. Yesterday, we reported on the controversy over a pair of crosses on top of a steep hill at Camp Pendleton. An atheist group wants them removed. Some local service members want them to stay as a memorial to fallen soldiers. I asked you yesterday what you thought. Here's how some of our viewers responded. People forget that religious freedom is for everyone, not just the atheist and for those other than Christians. If your religious beliefs don't bother me, why do mine bother you? And Gregory, Gregory West writes, the crosses should stay. They were placed privately without any government sanction. People should be allowed their right of religious expression without atheists hauling them into court and insisting that their religious views are the only ones generally acceptable. Another email, this from a retired military officer who wished to remain anonymous. He writes, we all know what to do with hill crosses. Get rid of them. Imagine how we with Christian backgrounds would feel if those were stars of David or Muslim moon slices. Andrew Soto writes, when viewed objectively, these crosses purely symbolize a lost life. They do not endorse or promote any particular faith. You can weigh in on this conversation by following us on Twitter, liking us on Facebook, and of course you can email me directly, jferian at kpbs.org. I always love to get your emails. And now Peggy has a recap of tonight's top stories. A judge has ordered the federal government to pay nearly $18 million in compensation to the family of four people killed three years ago in a marine jet crash in University City. The family had asked for $56 million. Several San Diego projects, including a new Charger Stadium, could be in for more money if the state Supreme Court overturns two state budget bills. Those bills eliminated redevelopment agencies unless those agencies made payments to the state. A lawsuit claims the bills violate a voter-approved measure to stop the state from taking money from local agencies. The court is expected to issue its ruling tomorrow morning. And whale watchers are getting an early treat this year. The annual gray whale migration has started a bit early. Experts at Birch Aquarium say they're seeing more whales than they usually do at this time of year. You can watch and comment on any of the stories you saw tonight on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thank you for joining us. Have a great evening, and we'll leave you with a look at our beautiful forecast. Tonight on KPBS at 8, a preview of what's to come when global warming causes Arctic ice to diminish.